Hello, universe. Blah. That's about the right opening for how I feel here on the 4th of July at 11.50 p.m. So yeah, the 4th is almost over. And I suppose that's neither here nor there for me since I don't feel much attachment to country, as I've illustrated before. But I don't begrudge the others celebrating and whatever capacity they enjoy. And if that includes lighting off fireworks over Elitch Gardens and Coors Field and whatever else anything in Denver is called anymore, well, good for them. Because there sure was a lot of noise tonight. And taking care of my dog through that noise was more important than seeing that noise, so I really didn't see much of it. Although last night I did ride my bicycle right underneath the Elitch fireworks display as they were going off over Spear Boulevard Bridge. So yeah, that was cool as fuck. So I guess I got my fireworks intake <clears throat> in one fell swoop on the third, thus negating any enthusiasm for the fourth. Plus there was no open mic tonight because it's the fourth and the bars are closed. Or at least the one that holds the open mic was closed. So I spent time with my parents and then I spent time stringing rackets, which means I didn't get a whole lot done today. But the reason I haven't been recording, well, this isn't true. I did record something, something I was very proud of and still think is very good. But, well, you know what? Let me take a bong hit before I get into this. Unpause. At any rate, two days ago, I, hang on. I, um, uh, I did a, an intro regarding the challenge of the five minute structural stage platform on which you get to um, present your talent. And having seen a couple of decent comedians, if not one professional comedian for sure, um, and it's not fair to say that there are, haven't been other professional comedians because there have been, but uh, Monday night at the Lion's Lair, last night at the Lion's Lair, um, there was a, a comedian who I didn't recognize but has um, has been showcased on Comedy Central and some other shit. So as the ones I've seen at the open mics go, he's the biggest I've seen. But I saw another woman who is headlining uh, a comedy show in Cheyenne, I think, <laughs> over the weekend. And I've seen another woman who uh, travels across Colorado and hosted the w Winter Park Comedy Festival. So, um, the more you go to these, the month or so that I've been doing it, the more you run into some some real talent. And um, last night, the two shows uh, that I went to were loaded with talent. And um, it's good to see. It's good to see. It is also um, intimidating as hell that... Uh, real comedic talent compared to your average, I think I'm funny Monday night, uh, open mic. Er, there are, there are, um, <laughs> there are ways that you can see, uh, who has the real comedic mind versus who just is trying to find funny in situations. And I'm not saying you can't even exist as that person trying to find funny in situations. But when you can craft comedy from concept into uh, presentable joke material that is concise and witty, the real comedians out there, it, it doesn't even matter what the material they're working is, you can see their craft inside of the actual construct of what they're presenting. Even if the the joke misses, you can see the structure of the joke. And that's important. Because telling funny stories just means this funny shit happened and I'm going to describe it and you're going to think it's funny. But creating a joke around um, the uh, works of Ralph Waldo Emerson is different uh, material to, to mine. 
And those who do it and do it well are real comedians and don't need to take a bong hit like this one to prop up their comedy. Pause. Mm. I've also come to respect emceeing. as its own skill set. Um, well, I don't mean its own skill set. I have come to see that um, effective MCs have um, an energy and, um, and mm, I guess it is a skill um, to uh, carry through the conversation that is the larger presentation without overwhelming it <coughs> or failing to um, engage it, make fun of it, um, appropriately mock it, whatever. There are just times when the MC um, is contributing uh, to keeping the audience uh, pinpointedly uh, attentive uh, rather than wandering off into, well, uh, maybe we should just close our check and go home. A good MC can make bad comics listenable. And I've seen that in action. So that skill, I think, is without making too much mockery of the mediocre comic material that may be there. There has to be some of that because, frankly, this is an industry in which uh, <clears throat> there is comeuppance immediately served to those who step boundaries that are uh, 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 wrongly um, overshot. But whatever. If you get into a situation where bad comedy is persisting, a good MC can work with that and still make the show tolerable. That, I will say, is a skill. All right, so why am I taking so long to get back to this recording? Because I'm so upset about the last one I did where I admittedly tried to get six different five minute structured um, uh, A to B progressions recorded and I did four pretty good ones one terrible one and one um, kind of a repeat of another one so a little redundant but the four good ones were good and one of them was six minutes long instead of five. Um, so there was that cheat. But trying to find a coherent presentation that is five minutes exactly isn't easy. And so I thought throwing six of those just randomly at my recording would be a good way to practice. And that's what I was going to post on the second. But because I hadn't noticed that I was recording in stupid low resolution format and because for reasons that I will not get into today um, I was recording in the bathroom <clears throat> well you can't understand it and I think also that two of my last recordings at the uh, at the open mics have been in low resolution format I think that's why I can't understand them now that I see what I've done um, uh, I hate that it's so easy to accidentally slip into that mode and not realize it with this stupid recorder. But that's user error that uh, obviously I can overcome. So blaming the uh, Samsung Galaxy S4 is a little bit cherry-picking the situation in my favor. However, that doesn't mean that these recordings uh, can be saved. And if I try to recreate them, I mean, if I give myself the topical matter, can I come close? Maybe. But the four that are good, I know I will just have in my head while I'm trying to re-record them and then think I'm either missing or over, you know. So in other words, I've tainted the process to the point that I should just start over with six new, go get it. Um, which may be what this recording ends up doing. Depends on how high I can get. I was so high on Sunday night, it was perfect. And my thinking was so fluid and probably had been, what, like... Uh, <clears throat> abducted by aliens the night before and implanted with a whole bunch of creative thought. It was just, it was really, um, it was really tight. Uh, I liked how I never 
ventured off of my original point throughout the five minutes of coming back to prove my point. Four times I did it well. One time I failed completely. And one time, like I said, it was just basically a reworking of another one. So, uh, do I try to do it again? And do I try to make those other two... Like the one that I failed on, obviously I can go back and fix. So there's that. And the one that I was redundant with, I can figure out a sixth, ten, or a, uh, approach that would be unique and try to get the one that was six minutes down to five, which of course is easy. That's not hard. And that <clears throat> six minute one meant that I made a four minute one, but the four minute one was the one that was kind of redundant. So getting six five minute concepts out would be uh, useful. And the one that went to six was because by the, when I got to five, I wasn't finished. I really had fucked up. I had, I had tried to make three points in the end all, uh, as my final proof and only got through the first point before I had, um, you know, five minutes gone by. So I needed the last minute to finish up. So I really fucked that one up, <clears throat> which I wouldn't do this time because I was wandering in the middle about shit that wasn't even relevant to the point. Obviously, like this. And um, on that note, while I continue to clean, concentrate off my thumb, I, uh, <sighs> I've been rejecting female advances for a month now. Except this one that's come my way. I'm sort of intrigued by. So I think for the first time in a long time, I may have met a good match. On that note, I'm going to pause. Okay, <clears throat> even though this, uh, as it were, uh, hand and glove fit sits right in front of me. And... <clears throat> Again, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't reciprocate when um, I feel the, <clears throat> the attractive vibe uh, very often, <clears throat> but with this one, it was like immediate. And <clears throat> at first I thought I was just flirting, because I'll do that. And then I realized that the chemistry and symmetry were uniquely complete. And so um, it'll be an interesting July and August. I know that. And, <clears throat> and it's also exactly the scenario in which I expected to fall. Um, so there's that. But this doesn't negate the whirlwind of insanity that I'm <clears throat> potentially uh, venturing back toward by getting hours again at the Home Depot. If I decide to do this, I don't know yet. i got to go in on Thursday and see what kind of conversation I can make. And I would be trying to restrict myself from the insanity that was there, even though I know that's grown worse since I left. <clears throat> But the personal chaos that I was put in there, I don't know that um, I haven't 100% overcome that, but this will put it to a test. So a lot of emotional upheaval occurring in ways that was um, a month ago completely non-existent is all going to go down in July and August. Some of it I welcome and look forward to. Some of it I uh, pray uh, I'm over-exaggerating and never occurs. And if it does, I hope I handle with grace and um, integrity. And certainly not with uh, self-doubt or uh, reluctant um, poor decision-making. Which are all patterns I can say I've been through before, so if they happen again, we'll just learn our lessons, right? Pause. Wow, I knew I had a ferocious burp coming. That was it. So I don't think I have another one. But I do have a bog hit coming, so let's pause for that. Okay, I'm pause. <clears throat> um, so I found two players' rackets 
from uh, about a decade ago that Vocal made. They're called PB10 mids. They're 93 square inch. Um, uh, I don't want to call them ProStaff uh, hybrid com or uh, uh, knockoffs, but <clears throat> there's a lot of ProStaff built into this frame. And so they play a lot like the frame I played in high school. And I haven't gotten to hit them yet because, of course, it's fucking raining, and it rained yesterday, and it hailed the day before, so it's fucking crazy weather again. We haven't had, well, since the emotional turmoil was put to an end, it has rained ungodly, or is it godly amounts? Whatever it is, there's been more rain than I think Colorado sees in 100 days ever in recorded history. The last hundred days. <clears throat> so, at least we got that going for us, which makes tennis not so easy to come by. But, uh, they're just sitting there perfectly strong, ready to go. One of them's got the hybrid neon green grip, and the other one's got the orange grip, and oh my god, I can't wait to go play those rackets. Anyway, um, I had stuff to talk about, so let's get back to the stuff I have to talk about. Um, why is it hard to structuralize a five-minute set of comedy. <clears throat> well, because you don't get five minutes to tell a story, <clears throat> unless it's compelling as fuck, which I haven't tried yet, but I don't know that I have something that's five minutes of compelling, must listen, must not look at phone, must not text friend, must shut mouth and stop playing pool. Like, how truly um, engaging can you be with total strangers, on a microphone, in the dark, in a room with half, if not 90%, comedians who are going up after you or have already gone before you. <clears throat> That's an environment in which a five-minute narrative had better be about something they're all interested in, which, frankly, is either comedy, stand-up comics, or what stand-up comics are going through to create comedy. And, yeah, you can get their attention on good, funny material, but it better be funny, and the timing of it had better be of value. In other words, it better come in a way that the comedian respects the effort. Bad jokes get told all the time, and bad material gets spoken about all the time. It's hard to do comedy about abortions. So, you can do it, but you better be fucking funny. Or at least you better have a take that is, um, that'll have advocates. You're going to wander into territory that's spicy and divisive. Well, then you better be able to win at least half the room with what you're coming on. Even if you lose the other half of the room, you win half the room. Those kinds of jokes can certainly gain traction and, and have their place. But you better be funny. <laughs> Ultimately, you better be fucking funny. And what's funny to a comedian versus what's funny to your grandmother are two very different things. So developing and honing your sense of comedic timing has to spread outside of open mics or else you're going to be jaded by the uh, comedian that you are experiencing night after night after night. You have to go watch actual shows. You have to see how comedy works in formats in which comedy is the point. Now, of course, comedy is the point in an open mic, but again, those rooms are designed for comedians to work their craft and to, <laughs> in many ways, bomb. So, if you're in a place designed to bomb and you bomb, well, what have you learned? I don't know. But... If you go to a place where you see comedy working, well, there you can take back lessons of how it was that it worked. And why it is that when you go to some of these open mic nights with aspiring professional comedians, the same jokes don't work. Learning this matters. And so that's another reason I have to go back and get some money because I got to start going to some shows that cost money. Open mics are at least free. Although, oh, uh, I did something I haven't done in a long time last night. I got drunk. I haven't been drunk 
fuck, in a decade, maybe longer. It's been a while. And I wasn't really drunk last night till I got home. And I rode my bike, so not like anybody was in danger other than me. And I didn't even know I was drunk. I decided to have a beer. Then I decided to have three. And then last call, I chugged a fourth. Four beers in what will be three hours. And, well, let's say two hours and 45 minutes. <clears throat> so that's um, a beer every, what, 40 minutes? Um, but to be fair, the last one was in like 15 minutes. And the first one probably took an hour. So, um, riding home, I was fine, but, um, I left somehow, well, my toaster oven has a particular malfunction to it that if you don't notice is I've left my toaster oven on many times. I usually catch it in real time, except for this time. And one other time when I've left it on unknowingly for a long period of time. And last night was one of those times. So I feel like, yeah, I was drunk enough that that happened, but it has happened to me sober many times. And one time in exactly the same circumstance, it happened and persisted just like last night. So was this because I was drunk? No. But of course, when you're drunk, you do stupid shit. So should that have happened again? Never. But it did happen again while I was drunk. And so when I found my little toaster oven on 450 degrees this morning, and it had been that way for about nine hours. Well, it made me realize how much <clears throat> alcohol is a terrible drug. It is a terrible drug. Like, it's just, it makes you um, uh, angry. Well, it, it makes you prone to anger outbursts. It makes you um, uncoordinated. <clears throat> it makes you... Um, boastful, or at least full of yourself, um, and it makes you, uh, hmm, it makes you feel, um, uh, I don't know if aggressive is, is, is not enough. It makes you feel, um, like you need to prove your worth. There's some about alcohol that is, that brings out the worst in people, at least in me. And a two-beer minimum would be perfect in this universe. Because at two beers, I think you're jolly, you're um, boosted in confidence, not full of yourself yet, you're um, amenable, but not aggressive, you're willing to try something new, but not stupid, daredevilly uh, dumb uh, with your uh, recklessness. And your motor skills may have deteriorated some, so I wouldn't recommend driving. But you can still handle yourself at the bowling alley or the pool table. And after three or four, well, that starts to become a lot less predictable. So, two beer minimum, or maximum, alcohol would be a good thing. But, because we can have four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, eleven, forty, well, I, uh, I think I may officially be done with beer. And alcohol generally. Or at least, I can't see a reason to order a third. There's just no upside. And a whole fucking lot of downside. So, if I ever have another beer, and I might have a second, but the third is forever out of the question. There just doesn't seem to be a place for it in my life anymore. And it's not like weed. I could smoke bong hit after 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 bong hit. Basically, once I hit my plateau, I just maintain. Alcohol, every next one, drills you down further. Till eventually you black out and fucking set your house on fire because you left your toaster oven going. So with that little diatribe, I would say, again, I don't tell you what to do, but if you're having four beers a night, unless you weigh 310 pounds, how's it working out for you? I bet not so great. Pause. And just to put a final point on that... Uh, turmoil at, at the Home Depot. There is a co-worker at Home Depot 
for I I had premonition dreams uh, that she was a distinct character in my dreams. I'm pretty convinced that I'm right here, but I have had those moments of doubt that maybe I confabulated the whole thing, but the only reason that I have doubts about confabulating the whole thing is because of the way that the end game all worked out, <clears throat> which was totally shocking to me uh, between us. So that <clears throat> led me to doubt my entire uh, dream reality. But the whole dream was her walking out of a tent and telling me there's nothing for you here. You need to move on. And that is exactly what life served up. <laughs> so uh, when I stand anywhere except in my own fucking shoes, wondering how it all went this way, well... The dream certainly told me it was going to. And it did. So, what can I say? The fact that <clears throat> I sit now in a position of hand-in-glove fittedness was maybe the point. But again, maybe so is being alone. I've, I've conceded that lone... Wolf status is what I've got left in life, which I'm fine with. And frankly, might have conceded too quickly to because so many ways the universe is signaling to me now that that's not the way it's going to go down. But, <clears throat> boy, do I feel like I've misread all these signals recently. So, what do I know? I know that I'm babbling on, and here we are. I don't even know because this is part two and part one. Pause too long. Who knows? We're like 20 minutes into this thing, probably. And I'm going to go get another Coke. Well, what am I going to... Oh, watermelon sandia soda. Be right back. Well, it's the 5th of July. <clears throat> so, happy uh, 12345 July. And in recognition of this, I thought I might put together five minutes of coherent thought about... The idea that sometimes when you arrive at the destination that you were targeting, it turns out that destination isn't exactly what you had envisioned. For instance, in June, my parents celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. <clears throat> and this, this is a milestone, no matter who you are. No matter who you're dating, who you're married to, who you are in love with, the idea that you would spend 60 years with them, well, first, the two of you have to live into that age range. Secondly, you have to have married early enough to enable 60 years of marriage to occur. And third, you have to, <laughs> you have to be in love enough to make it to the 60th year. And... Um, and, of course, what the Cialis universe would have us believe happens at this point in time are a bunch of uh, rainbows and butterflies and uh, bike rides in the, in the sunset. But what really happens is you make it to 60 years, and frankly, you have endured each other for 60 years. Honestly, at this point... They do live under the same roof, but while they have a bedroom that is the one they cohabitate in, they have separate sleeping schedules. They have separate eating schedules. They have uh, activities and vacations planned separately. This year, my mom went to Norway while my dad went to Seattle. And <clears throat> yet they are still married after 60 years. And in reflexivity, reflection, reflex, as a reflex to their <clears throat> overly committed lifestyle, well, the longest I've ever made it with any uh, committed relationship with a woman was 20 months. And since I've never done one with a man, I can only speak to those with a woman. 20 months. And... 
because I really like to create patterns for myself to make myself think, well, what the fuck does that mean? I have gotten to the 20 month mark seven fucking times. Seriously. And whatever it is, the 20th month is the month in which shit goes wrong or my lies become too much to deal with. That which you thought was going to be one way turns out to be something totally different. Much like sticking out of marriage for 60 years. Well, I may have been commitment phobic for most of my life having seen my parents in action. And I still feel like the idea of till death do us part is a little too much for anybody to have to commit to. But there's an there's an there's an honor and a nobility and a and a strength in seeing somebody make it for the sake of making it getting to 60 years committed to each other in a way that doesn't express love it's a partnership it's a straight up agreement to not leave the other one financially or um physically isolated they don't necessarily have what you would imagine 60 years of matrimony would bring about in terms of relationship dynamic. But what they do have matters. What they do have has proven to be stronger than anything I could envision, even with the perfect person. So when I think about where I'm going with comedy and this whole approach to trying to message to the universe that things are important today, that we're overlooking that which we need to see has value? Well, sometimes I think back to my parents, and I think, I wouldn't have stuck it out. I wouldn't have made it as far as they did. But then I'm not made up of what they're made up of, nor am I made up of what you're made up of. And it's only together that we're going to make this all work, right?